In this episode, I'm going to speak with Diana Chaplin from One Tree Planted. One Tree Planted is a nonprofit organization focused on global reforestation. They are listed as one of the most effective ways to combat climate change, and their target is $1 for one tree. Let's go to the interview. Thanks, Diana, for joining me today to talk about One Tree Planted. Hi, Bill. Happy to be here. So I had some just general questions to start with. How did One Tree Planted start? How did this get going? Where did this idea come from? Yeah, so One Tree Planted began in 2014 uh, in a pretty humble way. Our founder comes from the sustainable packaging world and business. He's also been an educator. He had a really sort of informal conversation with one of his colleagues who was trying to think about ways to uh, implement a CSR program to give back to the environment through business. Uh, and our founder, Matt Hill, said, well, you should plant trees. You know, that's one of the best things you can do for the environment. And at the time, there just wasn't really a very simple option for a business to be involved with reforestation in a way that scales and has a genuinely positive impact where you can see the reports and the stories and all of that and so you know his friend was like well you should start that and 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 so he did and so those are the beginnings and really the first few years was just trying to sort of create the structure to make sure that you can plant trees for under a dollar it's very important to make the model as simple as possible one dollar plants one tree so you know what one tree looks like you know how far your dollar is going to go so that was always really important from the beginning you know and it started with one project another project and i joined the organization pretty early on i was one of the first employees so when i started it was matt and uh, one other person and now we're about 30 people so we've come a really long way uh, we've learned a lot we've planted a lot of trees and it's been an amazing journey yeah, that's great. And I, I do like the one dollar one tree is kind of a nice target there. And you've been on a bunch of lists for effective ways to combat climate change. So that's actually why I reached out because of mm. your global reforestation focus. So could you just broadly talk about, you know, where you plant trees on what type of land? I mean, do you yeah. buy it or how that's done? And, and right. I also saw how do you protect or monetize once they're planted? Yeah, so we have projects pretty much all around the world. We have Africa, Asia, North America, South America, and Australia. And then within those countries, we will plant in a whole lot of different regions, not necessarily everywhere, really depends on the quality of the project. So the way that we determine a project, those can come to us in a variety of ways. So we now have a relationship with the World Resources Institute, which is a really large organization they have staff on the ground all around the world. They bring us projects. They help to vet the projects and the partners sometimes. Uh, in the U.S., we're also partners with the U.S. Forest Service. So there are some times where we have sort of network connections to these other, you know, environmental restoration, um, monitoring kinds of organizations. And through those, um, there might be a project that materializes. We also have a very specific uh, proposal process. You know, so if you're, for example, a watershed or, or a smaller organization and you're looking for funding to help execute on a project, whether it's a few thousand trees or a hundred thousand trees, we have a very detailed methodology whereby organizations and, and individuals can submit their proposal. The first filter is really, are they able to answer all of our detailed questions? Because it's not like just anyone that we might work with. You know, we really look for quality standards. Is there capacity? Is there a nursery nearby? We only work with local nurseries, local trees, native tree species. They never have to travel too far from the nursery that they're grown in to where the trees will ultimately be planted. You know, and these projects come to us in a variety of ways. We review them. We make sure that there's good quality. We have some amazing, you know, scientists on the team that are looking at a lot of the nitty gritty to really make sure that reforestation is done correctly, to make sure that there's not, you know, tree plantations, to make sure sure that there is 
an infrastructure in place for that long-term health and growth that you were asking about, you know, is what is the monitoring plan exactly? You know, how long um, does there need to be extra water? Do there need to be extra soil amendments to help keep the trees growing? And those first few years after you plant the tree are really the most critical as they're establishing roots. Um, so the climate conditions have to be just right. But, you know, the people that are kind of tending to that land play a very important role in the success of that project. So, you know, and then the reasons that we might take on a project really vary. And for me, that's the most interesting part is the story. Why are you planting these trees in this place at this time? There's so many reasons. It's not just about having more trees in the world. You know, some trees are planted around watersheds. Trees play a very important role in clean drinking water for millions of people. Sometimes there's a biodiversity component. Uh, we're planting trees now in, uh, in Africa, in Australia specifically geared towards helping endangered animal populations. In Australia, we're helping koalas recover after the terrible forest fire season that happened in 2019, 2020. Other times it might be climate. And there's always this component of a social impact and really working with local communities. That is essential because you really can't do good environmental restoration or conservation work without involving local people. A lot of times they're the most knowledgeable about the local ecology and how the trees should be planted. And they're very important in that conservation piece, you know, so taking their needs into account. If there's deforestation in the area, why is that happening and how can local communities be involved in restoration as well as the prevention of future deforestation because we want all of these trees to thrive in the long term. Um, so there's really a lot that goes into it and because we're a global organization it's very dynamic. Different you know, projects are happening at different times in the year depending on the rainy season. Um, there's really a lot being taken into account. Um, but you know, we really pride ourselves on good monitoring, good execution, having wonderful relationships with all of these people on the ground that, that help to carry out this work. So do you have staff in other countries or is yeah. everything filtered through the U.S.? So we do have staff and we have somebody in Brazil. Uh, we Most of our staff is in Canada. We have some in the US, a few parts of Canada in the US, um, as well as Australia. Um, so we do have staff in some locations, but we don't have staff in every single project. Um, one of our forestry and carbon scientists uh, once, you know, COVID and, and travel opens up again, um, he will actually be doing more traveling to personally visit all of our projects. Um, but we do work very closely with local partners. And if we do have a relationship with something like the World Resources Institute, they might have staff. So we kind of pool our resources together and do as much collaboration as we can to ensure that there's, there's quality execution happening on the ground. And we also get a lot of visual documentation that's very important, getting the photos you know what's happening um, usually on a monthly basis we get thorough updates video as much as possible just to make sure that we can really see what's going on and so that we can share it with our donors because that's really important donors want to know you know what happened with that dollar what's up with my tree so we try to be as communicative and transparent as possible as much as we can that's great do you find a bottleneck with projects I mean is there enough request for good projects to, to keep you busy or is that not an issue? Yeah, there's definitely a whole lot of projects. We have many projects now that are in need of funding, really great ones. Um, depending on the time and place, and sometimes even the political situation in certain countries. Um, so for example, the Amazon, you know, that tends to be very popular in terms of donors. And so we are, you know, we're always looking to expand and make sure we have more quality projects in certain regions. Um, others tend to be, for whatever reason, a little bit less popular with donors. So those are the ones we try to highlight more in terms of our communications. But generally speaking, um, there's a lot of restoration work that's being done that is in need of funding so um yeah we're doing pr pretty well there i imagine some projects would be more efficient too and, and maybe it's cost of labor or wherever they are but um or volunteers i guess are there it probably varies project to project whether you're paying staff to to implement the project or just doing a volunteer project 
Yeah, that's exactly right. The other thing is, you know, sometimes volunteers, they're wonderful and well-meaning. They don't always plant the trees, right? Um, so we basically, you know, when we have a larger reforestation project, we're typically working with either local staff that are our project partners or, you know, something like an agroforestry project, for example, that might involve a whole lot of farmers that are part of a co-op, that are part of a particular program through which this reforestation initiative is being done. So in that sense, they're kind of like, they're not volunteers. Some of the trees are being planted on their land. They're incentivized to participate. They're getting the trees, the training, and all of these other components for free. Um, however, it's also super important to involve people as much as possible if people want to visit a project or just getting their hands in the dirt. So what we do is a couple times a year, we organize a whole lot of public free volunteer events so that people can come. We try to to get all of the major cities in the United States so that you can, you know, when we have this, you can go on a page and see, is there an event near me? Yes. And you can sign up, bring the kids, bring the dog, you know, have a really good time and connect with your local environment. And we find that we get incredible feedback when we do that. People just have such a wonderful time. And it also helps to shift awareness, you know, because there's a lot of people that are really concerned about the climate crisis. They want to help. Um, sometimes all they can do is, you know, try to donate to organizations like ours and change their water bottle and things like that. But actually being able to get their hands in the dirt, to get dirty, to learn about the types of tree species in their area and to participate in a restoration activity close to home, it really just strikes them, you know, in, in their hearts and, and changes and shifts behaviors more in a very positive way. So we try to make those opportunities available as much as we can, but sometimes our other projects are need to be executed by staff because to be honest, it's more efficient that way. When you have trained professionals, if you're planting thousands of trees, you know, you know, they're they're working like a well-oiled machine they're very very efficient they might only have a few weeks to plant a whole lot of trees so there's a lot of planning that needs to go into that uh, but we try to cover all the bases and involve people as much as possible could you just describe a typical project i mean if or guatemala or africa or wherever but is it generally a uh, government land or national forests or protected areas and and how did they even get deforested is it coming in after fires? Yeah, well, the answer is yes, all of the above, I'm, to be honest. It depends on the project, you know? So like I mentioned, agroforestry, some of that might be owned by a whole, a whole bunch of farmers, for example, that want to integrate trees into their agricultural land because there are many known benefits to that um, in terms of the actual, the output of the crops that they're growing, but adding trees helps to add nutrients in the soil. They might be food producing trees. So now they're getting a socioeconomic impact as well as all of the wonderful climate, you know, environmental benefits of the trees. So that's a case where the land might be private. We do work in uh, national forests as well in the United States. So that's public land. Um, depending on the local partners, there might be a conservation easement uh, on those lands. You know, so really is the variety in terms of the land ownership. And as part of our vetting process, Process for projects, we make sure how will this be protected? How do we ensure the long-term survival of trees one way or another? And then in terms of the reasons, yeah, all of those reasons you named are reasons that we plant trees for forest fire restoration is a big one. And the caveat just because sometimes people say, well, you're planting more trees in an area where they might burn again. And so we are very mindful of reforestation in landscapes that are prone to fire. So like Australia, California, you have to do it in a very particular way. The trees are planted, they're more spaced apart so that when they grow, the crown canopies aren't too close. The types of trees being used might be more drought resistant, for example, in particular areas. Uh, in British Columbia, there's some interesting experimentation, frankly, being done in restoration ecology because aspen trees help to prevent fire spread. So the, the mix of tree species that are being incorporated are such that the trees that tend to have compounds within them that are less, um, you know, dry fuel fire spreading, um, they will be incorporated so that in the event of another forest fire, you know, 40 years from now in that particular area, which of course is something we can't 
control in a climate changing world. But what we are able to sort of really think about is, well, what are the tree species? How is that being done? Accounting for potential future of a changing climate, um, as well as many other you know, reasons for why trees might be planted, like I mentioned with biodiversity, preventing landslides, preventing erosion, conserving water sources, really just depends on the project and what is that story, what is that impact, it varies. That's the beautiful thing about trees is that they just have so many incredible benefits for, for people, for nature, for wildlife, that each project touches on a slightly different perspective and benefit. And do the projects generally come with knowledge about what trees and how they're going to do it, or is that something you bring in and, and adjust with them? It's a little bit of both, yeah. So typically we ask for the initial stage for there to be a pretty thought out proposal, right? And once we kind of have that and we say, okay, this is a solid proposal, this seems like a good project, then our staff would work very closely with the partners to then go through all of the details. We ask questions, we make recommendations, and then ultimately move forward together once we are in agreement and have a solid project plan. Great. No, that sounds great. And I saw that there was a commitment for like 6 million trees in 2020. How are you being impacted by the pandemic? Are you able to continue with your projects? Yeah, we are. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely been some some shifts, some changes. Um, some projects we may have had to scale down, but other projects are continuing. Some of them simply have new guidelines in place. For example, everybody's wearing masks. You know, hand sanitizer is now available. Some projects that typically would be open to volunteers now may not be, mostly to protect the staff so that yeah. we, they can ensure that they're continuing the work, they're taking individual safety precautions, and we're not taking any risks by, you know, having people travel and be in and out of some of these areas. Um, so, you know, and in some parts, forestry was considered essential. Um, so it really is based on the countries. Uh, and in some places, it did have to pause. And then we're talking to our partners and saying, OK, what are we going to what's the sort of new plan? How are we adjusting? How many trees do we are surviving? Like, is there going to be a financial loss? How are we going to account for that? What are we going to do next rainy season? So behind the scenes, there's really a lot of communication, a lot of logistics, a lot of problem solving that needs to happen. And COVID certainly has not been easy. But at the same time, climate change and environmental disasters in some way or another is something that on our end, we've had to deal with all of this time. There's infestations, there's, there's all of the, when you're working in nature, there's always going to be these unpredictable variables that, that come out of nowhere. So I think in that sense, we are we're resilient in that way. We can shift, we can adjust, uh, and that's what we're doing now through all of our partnerships. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I'm glad you're able to continue. And it seems like the projects, you know, should be able to continue even in this environment. I guess just there's going to be some limitations or some adjustments for sure. Exactly. Do, with, with the projects, it's it, is it shared funding? Like you'll bring some funding to it and maybe the other entity brings some funding to it? Yeah, I hate to keep repeating this, but it's simply true that it depends, you know. Okay. Um, so for some projects, it may be a very direct correlation and we're just working with a local partner on a particular project and it's pretty cut and dry and simple. Um, in other cases, you know, reforestation might be one component of a bigger, broader conservation initiative. You know, so in that case, we might be coming in as a reforestation partner. We have a project like this right now in the Pacific Northwest. The aim ultimately is to support the endangered southern resident orca whale population in the ocean. Um, but reforestation is an important component of that along the rivers and streams that feed into those waters because trees help to cool the water. They help the uh, salmon spawning grounds that happen so that there is more salmon uh, ultimately to end up in the ocean for the whales to eat. But having healthy 
um, coastal habitats is a very important part of that. Of course, there's other components. There's education. There's pollution cleanup. Um, there's there's dams. You know, so these are being addressed by a coalition of organizations. So that's an example where we're coming in for the tree part, but we're part of a much bigger story, a broader initiative that has all kinds of things interconnected. And that's the thing about the environment too. You know, everything really is interconnected. The water, the air, the wildlife, the trees. And so yet again, with the project, it kind of just depends. Uh, but we like to collaborate and we like to problem solve. So based on the situation, we kind of work together to see what's the best course of action. That makes sense. I think you mentioned carbon offsets. I, I'm not sure even how that works, if there's certifications or if you have to verify or, I mean, companies could purchase offsets. So as a whole, uh, the way carbon offsets work is that they have to be verified and tradable on the carbon market. Most of those currently come through the conservation of existing forests because there is an auditing process that needs to happen to confirm an estimated amount of carbon that these particular trees and forests are already sequestering in order to put a value on it in a way that somebody could then you know, purchase keep or exchange or trade and things like that. Um, however, reforestation is emerging in this field. The thing with reforestation is that when you plant trees, there's so many benefits that come from this. Carbon sequestration is one such component, but a tree doesn't really begin to meaningfully sequester carbon until it reaches a certain level of maturity. You know, there's variations in terms of tree species and location, how fast they grow, but approximately seven years is an average. So it's a little bit different in terms of reforestation. You might be investing in um, future carbon sequestration. Along the way, you're having many, many environmental impact benefits. And so what happens is um, some of our projects, the trees are planted in such a way that they are being prepared. Um, they the whole project really has to be done in a very meticulous way in order to meet all the qualifications and standard and criteria. So across the board with One Tree Planted, everything um, is not done in this way because you can have wonderful projects that have many benefits. They're just not following specific guidelines in order for the, for the carbon to be verified and tradable. Um, but other projects are. Are. So it kind of is across the board, but I do think there is a misconception out there that if you plant a tree, then oh, you've erased some of your carbon. Yeah. I really, it doesn't work like that. It is a more long-term investment that we're making in future carbon sequestration, um, but typically it's more about conservation if you're focused specifically on offsets. Gotcha. And you said seven years. I didn't quite get that. In seven years, a tree is able to significantly. Yeah, exactly, because um, they store carbon in their roots, in their trunk, in the branches and the leaves. And until it reaches a certain size, you know, where it really starts doing that efficiently, as it's growing, actually, they, they do do that. Um, and young trees actually sequester um, much faster. Um, but in the long term, it's more mature trees that end up sequestering more. So typically, when they reach that level of maturity, you know, in the tropical areas, it might be a little bit earlier. Um, in the northern hemisphere might take a little bit longer, but approximately seven years is when typically they start really sequestering a lot more carbon than they were in their, you know, childhood and adolescent years. Sure, sure. I think anything else you want to add, I guess, where can people get more information and where can they follow you? Yeah, we're at onetreeplanted.org. Uh, you can go, you can choose where you want to plant your tree. We're also at One Tree Planted across the board on social media. We love engaging with people. Ask us questions anytime and come plant trees with us. That's great. All right, Diana, thank you very much for your time and I wish you well with your projects. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to AIO Financial on this series of effective altruism interviews. And I hope you got something out of that. This has been brought to you by AIO Financial. If you need help with any part of your finances, please contact AIO Financial for a free meeting, aiofinancial.com. And we do have a free ebook that provides information about sustainable, responsible impact investing how to invest in line with your values, how to make a positive impact with your investments. It's at impactfinancialplanners.com backslash S-R-I.
ebook. All right, I appreciate any comments, questions, emails, any information or any feedback is appreciated. You can get our contact information at aiofinancial.com or just comment, subscribe where you're viewing this. I'll leave a rating, leave a comment, appreciate any interaction that you have. All right, take care, stay safe.